Hartby and Lasko would like to thank the following sponsors for making our show possible. Browns Electric. Thank you, Browns Electric, for your generous support. Heartbeat Alaska is also brought to you by Frontier Flying Service. Thank you, Frontier, for getting Heartbeat Alaska airborne. Heartbeat Alaska is made possible by Kupik Carlisle Transportation, your full-service transportation and logistics company. One, two, three, four, let's go. It's Heartbeat. It's a fabulous show. Alaska. Hi, Heartbeat Alaska. It's Heartbeat. <laughs> Alaska. Pull up a chair and enjoy the show. You hear it from Sitka to Barrow. Gather around for Genie's show. It's the alley. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Heartbeat Alaska Native News. I'm Jeannie Green. Thank you so much for joining me. Today, we have a fabulous program. It's complimentary from Alaska Native Heritage Center, Kayaks and Canoes. It's a two-part program. And at the end of this program, if you'd like to purchase this tape, we've got an address. You can purchase it from the Alaska Native Heritage Center. Travel with me now as we journey across the state from one end to the other, visiting different tribes, different nations within the state of Alaska, and taking a look at their kayaks and canoes. You're watching Heartbeat Alaska. A lot of people have come to look at kayaks as just sort of a uh, set of points or a form uh, to be reproduced in whatever material you know, is conveniently available. But the, what these kayaks are, it's more of a living being, a set of joints that articulate and move. And the whole boat is literally just a whole set of joints that uh, are constantly working. And that's what the kayak is. Travel with me now from one end of the state of Alaska to the other as we take a look at a means of travel that kept our natives moving from one end of this state to another. Here's part two of Kayaks and Canoes, Native Ways of Knowing. Philip Moses from Nelson Island also built a Yupik kayak at the Alaska Native Heritage Center with the help of John Alekka and George Nevak. Philip worked very closely with his cousin and friend, John. According to Yipik culture, John is Philip's Iluk. The term Iluk denotes a close companionship between two men, preferably cousins, who are paired together as children and work and hunt together throughout their lives. <laughs> Even the elegant bow design of the Ipikayak has an important function. The round hole serves as a handle for carrying the kayak. The bow hole, or the ukin kujuk, was used to lash kayaks together like pontoons. The cockpit, or combing, is broad enough to allow two men to kneel upright facing opposite directions. They could easily paddle and hunt, storing equipment and game in the hull of the boat. The wife of the kayak owner would traditionally prepare the threads. Before the women begin to sew the seal skins, the men cut and fit the skins to the shape of the frame. Sophia Gim.
After the skins are stretched on the frame, it is the Yupik way for the men to sew the final seams around the Uginkujuk or bow hole and around the combing and the top seam of the kayak for added strength and good luck when hunting. A Yupik man could not be a successful hunter without his hunting tools. His digun, gaff hook, dugak, ice pick, nikhjik, harpoon, nu zahbak, bird spear, nokak, spear thrower, and khuinak, his seal float. The frame of the kayak is stained red with wheat but the tools are stained with a special blue clay, kazuvak. The blue does not scare animals. The red reminds them of blood. There are just a few elders like Philip Moses and Frank Andrew who can pass on their first-hand knowledge of building a skin-covered yipik kayak. The sharing of this knowledge with apprentices at the Alaska Native Heritage Center was an important part of this project. <laughs> yeah, you guys did it. <laughs> the cultures of the Inupat and St. Lawrence Island Yupik peoples center around hunting the walrus and the bowhead whale. Massive skin-covered open-decked seafaring boats were used by Alaska Native peoples from Kodiak to Point Barrow. They are called umaks among the Inupak people and Ungyapiks by the St. Lawrence Island Yupiks. They can carry loads weighing several tons and are still used for traditional subsistence activities. The umak used for whaling today is constructed in much the same way as it has been for thousands of years. Of all the watercraft built at the Alaska Native Heritage Center in the summer of 2000, the Amyapik is the only boat still regularly used for subsistence activities. The Amyapik is covered with tough, durable walrus skins. The skins undergo a long preparation process. After the hair is removed, the skin is stretched on a frame. Then a woman splits the hide down the middle to double its size. There are only a few women who still know how to split walrus skins. Before contact with Europeans, the Angyabik was made with all natural materials found on St. Lawrence Island, driftwood, sealskin rope, and walrus hides. Today, Commercial lumber is used to build the frame, but driftwood is still used to shape the bow and stern. Modern tools, such as the saw and electric drill, have replaced some traditional tools. Dry walrus skins are tough and brittle. They must be soaked until they are pliable before sewing them on the ungyabik frame, traditionally with braided whale sinew. Leonard Abangaluk is a whaling captain in his hometown of Gamble on St. Lawrence Island. He has built several ungyabiks over the years and is passing on the skills of building ungyabiks and the subsistence lifestyle to his family. Leonard built this frame with apprentices Ronald Abangaluk, Roger Seeluk, and Justice Abangaluk. Before contact, the people of St. Lawrence Island constructed flat-bottomed boats. In the 1930s, they adopted a new frame design that incorporated a curved bottom with bent ribs. 
The curved hull offers many advantages over the flat-bottomed hull. It is more streamlined in the water and responds well with the increased power of the outboard motor. Fewer parts are used to construct the frame, making it easier to build and repair. The steam-bent ribs are easier to construct than the carved ribs of the flat-bottomed boat. Ungebics maneuver better than aluminum boats in the pack ice. The flexibility of the frame, combined with the pliable walrus skins, withstands the shocks of beaching and ramming into ice. Unlike the noisy aluminum skiff, the Ungebic moves quietly in the ocean when stalking sea mammals and is easily repaired with locally available materials. Leonard de Bangalo. We have women that specialize in splitting the hide to double the size. That hide, when it's stretched on a frame, is about three quarters of an inch thick. And it has to be split right down the middle to double the size. The Ungebic is normally covered with two split walrus skins. The skins are tied to the bow, stern, and gunwales of the boat with strips of bearded seal hide. My father taught me how to do it, and I learned by looking. We don't write them on a paper. We don't make direction, but we watch and learn. At the center, the walrus skins were waterproofed with conventional varnish instead of whale blubber. Often the skins are painted with commercial paint. Finally, the seams were caulked with silicone gel. Contemporary materials were used on this Ungebic to preserve it as an educational tool long into the future. Since we continue to use these skin boats out there at Gamble, it's important for our young people to uh, learn how to repair, build these skin boats. Building of this boat here at the center, we hope will help the outside world to understand how we live. The Unangan, Aleut, and Sukhbak, Alutit people engineered the kayak to near perfection thousands of years ago. The Unangan traditionally inhabit the Aleutian Islands. The Sukhbak inhabit Kodiak Island off the southwest mainland of Alaska and the coastal areas of Prince William Sound. The Unangan two-hatched kayak is called an Uluqtak in the Unangan language or Baidarka in the Russian language. On the volcanic, windswept, and treeless Aleutian Islands, the Unangan people used driftwood to make the frames of their ikyach and uluqtach. The Unangan and Sukhbak people encountered outsiders in the late 18th century, long before other Alaska native groups. Much of the Unangan and Sukhbak people's traditional ways of life were lost. Before contact with the Russians, the Unangan people developed a highly complex culture centered around the use of the ikyak when hunting. Today, there is a renewed interest in learning the Unangan ways, including how the ikyak were built. These ivory-bearing surfaces help to make the frame extremely flexible. I'm still learning, but a little bit of effort there. You can't go wrong. My name is Michael Livingston. I was raised in Cold Bay on the end of the Alaska Peninsula. I'm Aleut, and uh, for me, the uh, Baidarka is a very important way of learning about the culture of my ancestors. Mike is a detective in two different worlds. During the week, Mike is employed as a detective with the Anchorage Police Department. On the weekends and evenings over a three-month period, he used his investigative skills to reconstruct an Unangan Uluqtaq at the Alaska Native Heritage Center. There's a lot of... Uh, lost secrets about the Baidarka, why, uh, why they were put together the way that they were. Uh, it's, it's all kind of a huge puzzle that uh, has been 
kind of disintegrated and have lost over the centuries. It is commonly believed that the Unangan Iqyakh is the finest of all kayaks made by northern peoples. While there are some who remember being a passenger in their parents' or grandparents' Iqyakh many years ago, the Unangan and Sukhbak people living today do not have a direct link to the ancient ways of Iqyakh building. Master boat builders learning to build Unangan and Sukhbak kayaks must study historical information and surviving kayak frames. Mike Livingston has been studying the craft of building the Uluqtaq for more than 20 years. Mike worked with several young apprentices to build the frame of the Uluqtaq. Many others helped with the skin sewing process. This is the first time skins have been used to cover an Unangan Uluqtaq in more than 80 years. In the 20th century, many Alaska natives replaced skin or bark coverings with canvas when building kayaks and canoes. The process of skin sewing is very time consuming and labor intensive. Boy, in five years we're going to be really good. Traditionally, it would take several women to sew the hides onto the uluqtaq. Many of the boat builders at the center shared their knowledge with each other. The Unangan crew learned skin sewing techniques from the Yupik women. The skins are laid on the frame, tacked together with a temporary stitch, and then removed from the frame. The skins must be kept wet throughout the sewing process. Here's how the waterproof seam is sewn. First the threads are prepared. Three strands, about two and a half yards long, are cut to slightly different lengths. They are braided together, strengthening the thread. The ends are scraped to taper them, then two finer pieces of thread of different lengths are braided in. Tapering makes it easier to thread the needles, and easier to pull the thread through the tough skin. A straight running stitch fastens the skins together. Making sure you got it in between the skin and not poking all the way through. The sewers are careful not to fully penetrate the second skin. The skins are then turned over, inside out. A blade of beech rye grass is inserted in the seam for increased waterproofing. Finally, a whip stitch finishes the seam. Sharing our knowledge to each other, even their students, they share what they learn and I share what I know. So it's been a very learning experience for me. And uh, it's very rewarding. I'll, I'll go, go home to Kodiak with a big smile on my face. Koyana. The Unangan Iqyakh and the Sukhbak Ayaks are very similar in construction. They are built for speed and long distance travel. With their sleek design, they required great skill to use in the unforgiving coastal waters off the Aleutian and Kodiak Islands. I was born. In Nanualik, I used to be Nanualik in this bay and back to Nanualik. This is the third Sukhbak kayak that Nick Tanape and Gregor Welpton have made together. The Unangan and Sukhbak kayaks were made for one or two hunters. Each sat in an individual cockpit. This allowed one to hunt while the other paddled the craft. And here's the hoop, which we bent up our first day. We just wanted something fun to do right off the bat. What you call hardwood. Hard to carve. Each part of the kayak frame is hand carved for precision. The stringers are rounded to ensure that they do not grate against the skin covering and connecting parts of the frame. The ideal bow is made from a piece of driftwood with curved grain that mirrors the shape of the bow. Kayak, I've seen them before when my parents used them for traveling and hunting, I was really young then too. I always wanted to pick it up and learn to do and making them. And this particular wood, you gotta look for it. It's not an easy job looking for it. And like this one took me three days, 20 miles. For thousands of years, kayak builders have been constantly innovating to build a better boat. 
Nick and Gregor continued this tradition when they fashioned their effective wood steamer. The ribs of the Unangan and Suchbekayak are bent with steam. The ideal material for the ribs is green spruce. This strong and flexible wood is cut from living trees when the sap is running. I want you to together lash this up and I want you to pull the lashings really, really tight and then we'll put the pegs inside of The it. apprentices, Keelan, Nick Jr., and Jeremy are from the village of Nanwalik. The frame of the Sukhbaqayak is fastened with artificial sinew and pegs. This allows the frame to flex in response to the ocean's waves and currents. A lot of people have come to look at kayak as just sort of a uh, set of points or a form uh, to be reproduced in whatever material you know, is conveniently available. But the, what these kayaks are, it's more of a living being, a set of joints that articulate and move. And the whole boat is literally just a whole set of joints that uh, are constantly working. And that's what the kayak is. Uh-oh, the boss is back. It's very, very good work. The bow piece is an ingenious design. The bottom part cuts through the water with minimal resistance. The top piece adds buoyancy. Without the top part of the bow, it would dive under the waves. We're just going to let that sit for a little bit. Between the wind and the sun, I don't know which is worse. They're both really drying us out. <laughs> oh no, no, what are you doing? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> the knowledge of how to sew skins on the Sukhbaq kayak was almost lost forever. With their experience at the Alaska Native Heritage Center, June and Grace now have the responsibility to pass on their knowledge of the watertight stitch. When people come to view this, they're, they're not just viewing a, a sea boat or a sea vessel. You know, they're viewing culture and, and something that is alive. In the days to come, we will have new songs and new dances to celebrate our cultures. As seagull songs fade with daylight, campfire flickers near twinkling stars. Children's heads are laid on laps, hear ancient stories of hunts and wars. Waves whisper with ocean sand as men tell of journeys far and near. Hunters, a storehouse of Sukhbaq lore, of an ancient message. Alutik Blessings, an excerpt from a poem written by June Simeonov Pardu. Thank you so much for joining me on Heartbeat Alaska. Please, if you'd like to purchase a copy of Kayaks and Canoes, stay tuned for the billboard that's coming up in just a moment. God bless every single one of you. Join me again next week, won't you? I'm Jeannie Green. We'll see you then. VHS copies of this video are available. For information, contact the Alaska Native Heritage Center at 907-330-8000 or visit our website at www.alaskanative.net.